Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement 2, second channel video, and this one is actually a follow-up to a main channel video about overclocking the IBM 5170, and also a couple other things. So in that main video, which I'll link down in the description below, I had this box of random PC parts that I was given. It was all stuff that was gonna get thrown away. And inside of this, there were four motherboards that I went ahead and tested. Two of them didn't work because they were battery damaged. One that had a little bit of battery damage worked, and that was a 386SX 40 megahertz. And then the last motherboard was this one, which is on the bench, which is an IBM 5170 Type 1 motherboard. Here again is that Type 1 motherboard. Now it's a little bit different than the last time you saw it because there are heat sinks stuck all over it. And that's because in that main channel video, I managed to overclock this six megahertz board up to eight megahertz. That overclock involved removing the original ceramic CPU here that was only rated for six megahertz and installing a PLCC socket directly onto the motherboard. I didn't solder this in, this is actually pushed into the socket that was already on the board. Then I inserted this Harris 20 megahertz 286 into the board. Well, at first I inserted a 12 megahertz one, it didn't seem to work at all. So I inserted this 20 megahertz chip into that socket and then it worked. That was still running the board at six megahertz. So right here is a crystal oscillator and it's in a little socket. So I popped out the original 12 megahertz part which is divided by two to create six megahertz. And then I inserted this part here, which is a 16 megahertz crystal, which allowed the board to run at eight megahertz. Everything was great. And then on Saturday, which was yesterday, at the time of filming this video, I released the video on the BIOS patching for the IBM 5170 to remove a bunch of those flaws, like those error codes and stuff like that. So you can check out that video in the description below if you haven't seen that. Well, there was a comment from Angela on that video saying that the original Type 3 BIOS had a check that IBM put in there to check for overclocking of the CPU. And sure enough, when I asked Stuart about it, he went and looked at the code. It looks for anything over 5% of an increase and it will actually halt the computer. Now, strangely, it also seems to check for an underclock and supposedly it checks for a 10% underclock and will also cause like a beep or a halt or something like that when it detects that. But I was running the Type 3 BIOS on a six megahertz machine perfectly, which is more than a 10% underclock from eight megahertz. So my hunch is that the BIOS is checking for anything 10% under six megahertz and then anything 5% over eight megahertz and then it will flag an error or halt the machine. I actually ran into that particular problem when I tried to run this crystal in the machine, 17.7 .7 megahertz y and change, and that would result in the machine running at about 8.8 .8 something megahertz. When I turned on the machine with that faster crystal in there, the postcode would stop at 11 and the machine would never initialize the graphics card or really do anything more after this point. At the time, honestly, I just assumed that the problem was that the chips on this board weren't capable of running at anything over eight megahertz. I know that a lot of the stuff like the DMA controller and the interrupt controllers are basically specced for eight megahertz, and I just assumed they were running close to the limit, or potentially this original type one board, which of course runs at six megahertz, has some chips on it that were really designed for six megahertz, and even eight megahertz was a bit of an overclock, but it worked, but that 8.8, .8 pushed it too far. Well, armed with the knowledge that there was indeed a speed check in the BIOS, I just simply asked Stuart to figure out how to just jump past those speed checks altogether, and then we could see what this board can actually do. Well, these BIOS chips on the board here are the regular patched version that I had been working with in my patched videos, but they still contained the speed checks. So I have a new set here that I have made, and these ones do not have the speed check in them at all. So the reason why this board has some heat sinks on it already is because, yes, I've already been testing this, and the crystal oscillator that's in here right now is actually a 20 megahertz crystal, which means when I power this on, this board will be running at 10 megahertz. Here we go. Let's turn that on. The video has initialized. As you can see, I'm running a 16-bit VGA card. I have my XT IDE card in here, which is now fixed. I will talk about that in a second, and I have a floppy controller and the post card. And here we go, it's gonna boot up off the XT IDE. 
And, and let's go into landmark speed test. And there we go, Intel 286, 10.02 megahertz, and the equivalent speed is 11.23 megahertz. That is simply incredible. When you overclock machines like this, the speed scaling is actually linear because there are no clock dividers on this board. Everything is just running much faster than it was when it was running at six megahertz. The ISA bus itself is now running at 10 megahertz versus six megahertz. So yes, that's an overclock. ISA is basically designed to run at eight megahertz, which was the speed, the fastest speed that the 5170 ever ran at. And every ISA bus after that was just copying that. So when you had a faster machine, like a 33 megahertz machine, it would divide that clock down to eight megahertz so that you weren't overclocking these cards. But obviously these cards at least are working fine at 10 megahertz. So all my testing of the BIOS patching, when I was using these EEPROMs, these were 200 nanosecond EEPROMs, which I'm sure are very similar to the original mask ROMs that were in the IBM. I put 120 nanosecond ROMs on here for testing this machine at 10 megahertz. I don't know if this is completely necessary or not, but that is what I used. The RAM is still the original 200 nanosecond RAM because of course this type one board doesn't use normal 41 256K chips. If it did, I could easily just swap those out with like 80 nanosecond or 100 nanosecond chips. I have tons of that stuff. And then it would be running within spec. I'm pretty sure that 200 nanosecond chips like this are not spec'd to run at 10 megahertz, but it's clearly working right now and it seems to be stable. These chips down here are bank zero. So this is where most of like what you're running on the computer is running out of. It's the lower 256K of RAM. And it definitely, these get warm. They don't get hot, but they get warm. The upper bank doesn't seem to get warm. And I'm assuming that's because there's just a lot more access happening in this lower bank of memory than there is in the upper bank. That's my hypothesis at least. I'm not totally sure if that's the case. Now running this thing also at 10 megahertz, I found that these chips that have heat sinks on them all were getting rather warm. Not too hot to touch or anything like that, but warm. Everything else on this board is just slightly warm, so I wouldn't really consider it an issue. And when you add heat sinks like this, if you enclose the motherboard in an area where there's no fans, the heat sink doesn't really do anything. You have to have a little bit of airflow in the case to blow over those heat sinks to help cool those chips. And I was using this fan right here to do that. I shut it off for the video, so it makes a bit of noise. But that definitely kept all these chips nice and cool. Now the CPU, I am not using the Harris chip, as you can see, because I showed that a second ago. I am using another 286 chip. Now, in the first video where I was testing this and I first put that socket in there, I had a 286 processor in my bag of chips and it didn't seem to work. It wouldn't post at all, even at six megahertz. So where did I get this 12 megahertz chip from? Well, I took it off this motherboard. This was the one that was battery damaged, had quite a bit of damage here, and it had the processor right here and it was surface mount. So I just fired up the heat gun and I yanked that chip off of the board. And then I used a little bit of solder braid or solder wick to remove the excess solder that were on the pins, stuck it in there in the socket, fired right up. I'd rather not waste this 20 megahertz chip on this machine that's only running at whatever, like eight or 10 megahertz, 10 megahertz right now, but maybe eight if it's not totally stable. This Harris chip runs really, really cool. It barely gets warm to the touch, even running at 10 megahertz. But I gotta say that this chip, which is spec for 12, even with that little heat sink on there is super hot. I guess that's just the way it is. Now in the video when I was testing this, when I brought it up to eight megahertz from six, I found that my XT IDE card stopped working. And I had mentioned that I had had a few weird similar issues with this card in other machines. And I had just built this and hadn't really tested it exclusively. It seems to work fine on like XTs and stuff, but in faster uh, AT machines, it doesn't always work. Well, I pointed out in that last video that I thought maybe it was some of these chips here because these are what connect the compact flash card itself or whatever's plugged into IDE to the bus. This one here is a 74 ALS 688, and this one was a 74 HCT 245, and it's this chip right here. Well, HCT chips are CMOS chips, but they should be compatible with TTL, but I think their threshold levels are still different than the original LS parts. So what's on here now is just a regular old 74LS245N. And this is actually a, quite a, a new chip. Like I bought this from DigiKey, it's not one I got from China. So I pop that on there. 
and I put this in the machine and it immediately worked. So that completely fixed that problem. Uh, so just keep in mind that while the HCT chips are supposed to be compatible with TTL levels, which is definitely what this thing runs at, doesn't seem like it always works, at least uh, in the case of whatever's going on with this motherboard. So just in case anyone was gonna ask, I did test this particular crystal right here, 24 megahertz. That would have run this machine at 12 megahertz. That did not work. When I put that in here, it would start to post and then I would get strange postcodes and definitely was problematic and would not work. So I went back to this one that runs it at 10 megahertz and it seems to be stable. There are some small weird issues though that have happened. Occasionally when I reboot the machine, it's usually after it's been running for a while and I hit control alt delete, I will get system unit failure with a 108 and on the postcode it stops at 29 hex. Stuart went and looked up that check and it seems to be checking like timer B on the board or, or something around that. The weird thing is, is even though it seems to be detecting a problem sometimes, if I just power cycle the computer, like you can't control delete at that point, it just freezes totally. If I power cycle it, it just works. And then in addition, on top of that, I left this thing running with the fan blowing over the motherboard at 10 megahertz playing the loop demo of Thexter and it totally had no issues, no freezing, no weird, nothing, just worked. I ran the check it looping thorough memory check on the 512K, that worked as well. In fact, I haven't been able to find a single stability issue with this machine running software, at least with these cards that are installed in it. The only thing that's ever popped up with this thing overclocked like this is that weird 108 error. So I think that kind of shows that this machine right now is running right on the ragged edge of stability. So it might be probably a good idea to get a different crystal that maybe lowers it down to nine and a half megahertz, something like that. It's also maybe possible to use a clock synthesizer chip with a little Arduino. So you could just custom clock the thing to whatever exact amount you wanted. That would probably work fine. The 17.7 megahertz crystal here, these are very easy to get because this is like a PAL clock crystal. It's like used in Commodore 64, for instance, when you have a PAL machine. These are really easy to get and would result in like an 8.8 .8 megahertz speed. So even that's a good overclock for the type three motherboards. And then of course for type ones like this that are only six, that's a significant overclock. Here's the ancient benchmark called MIPS, which I've shown on the channel before, it comes from uh, Chips and Technologies, they made this, and it's from 1988. The IBM AT8 megahertz, this would show a performance of 1.0 for all of this if this machine was running at the stock eight megahertz. But running at 10 megahertz, we're obviously getting a 25 uh, to 26% increase in performance over that machine. But of course, as I mentioned, at six megahertz, this would be getting under 1.0. So we have even bigger of an increase. We're getting a 66% overclock right now. If I run Planet X3 here, I have to say the performance improvement is dramatic from the regular Type 1 motherboard. The game is totally fine now. And when you run at six megahertz, you can actually see the game updating the VGA buffer and you can just slightly make that out now, but it, the performance difference here is staggering, is absolutely staggering. It makes the game actually playable, well, enjoyably playable at this point. So here's maybe a stability issue. I went to run DOS Bench. <laughs> um, and that's interesting. So the DOS Bench is uh, Phil's Computer Lab's little suite of tools. And when I ran the batch file there, it was sitting here at please enter an option and then you saw it was scrolling with all that junk. That's weird, but I was able to terminate out of it so like it wasn't crashing the whole computer. So like I said, maybe this thing is not totally stable. Let's try good old top bench here. Okay, actually no, now the computer is locked up. Well, at least that was. Now let's see if we get that 108 error. Okay, we're not getting the 108 error because it seeked the floppy. It would usually crash before that. I'm gonna turn this fan back on here just to start blowing air across the CPU and the, these chips. Yeah, they're pretty warm. This one here is relatively warm. Let's see, of all of these, what's the hottest? The CPU is the hottest. This is really, really hot. Um, this one here is probably the next hottest. And since I covered it up, I'm not quite sure what it is, but it looks like it's U... 
24 maybe? Part of the silk screen is, is worn off there, so I can't quite see. Ooh, yeah, CPU. CPU is so hot. In case you're wondering about this LCD, I will have a video coming out soon with a review. Well, it may already be out by the time you see this. I'm not sure I've finished the video, but I'm not sure when it's going to be released. Let's check out real-time benchmarking. Okay, so I had to hit pause because it kept kind of jumping around. But the machine that seems to be the closest to is the Sega Terra Drive M3. AMD 8286 at 10 megahertz. Well, that certainly makes sense. VGA adapter. Submitted by High Treason. Hello, High Treason. Great videos. And he was running the IBM BIOS, but has a 1991 date on there. So I don't know if IBM licensed their BIOS to Sega. 2.5 megabytes, 30 meg hard drive, lots of proprietary stuff. So anyhow, it's a pretty close match, which is pretty great considering this thing would be slow otherwise. Unfortunately, this machine only has 512K of RAM, so I can't really do a good comparison test from a game perspective to the six megahertz machine that I showed off in the video series because that thing had a three meg expansion card and that thing is all buttoned up right now. So I'll have to do more testing in the future. In fact, I would like to overclock that machine or at least put this motherboard, which I know seems to work, into that case because I complained in that video series that six megahertz was a little bit slow. And I think this overclock would be very beneficial for getting a much more useful 286 machine out of the IBM 5170. I was just narrating an outro to this video and I noticed that the computer has frozen, totally locked up. Let me just do a quick power cycle and see if we get that 108 error that I was talking about. I mean, I, I, this sort of proves that no, no error still. So weird. It could have been crashed because I kept touching and poking at the board and who knows how stable this socket in the socket with the CPU in there all is. I don't know. Hopefully for just pure stability, maybe I'll try to find an 18 megahertz crystal and run that in here, or I'll go back to that 17.7 megahertz crystal and just not have to worry about this very slight instability that this machine does seem to still have. So hopefully this BIOS patch will be useful to the community and people can have their overclocked 5170 running the stock IBM BIOS, well stock, stock with patches, just to take out the need to use those AMI or Phoenix BIOSes that people have been using in these boards to get around those checks. If you download and try out this patched BIOS on your Overclock 5170, I would love to hear your experience about using it and how stable it is on your board, because obviously your mileage will vary for how fast and stable the board is at different speeds. I'm probably gonna leave this board running on loop for a few hours or longer just to see if this thing is stable overall. But overall, I am just shocked and amazed and this is so cool. Such a great overclock if this really does work. So if you like this video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel, it really helps me out and check out my main channel if you haven't seen that already. And check the comment section below for other people's thoughts on this and of course put your own thoughts. And thanks to my patrons, I really appreciate all their support. You can become a patron too. There's a link in the description for that. And I guess that's going to be it. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.